Hello, welcome to makeup and I always say it like that. Welcome to Makeup and Monarchies. I'm Tiffany, if you're new here. I am a makeup artist, cosmetologist, and Anglophile and love anything UK medieval history related. This week we're going to be doing our second episode of the Henry VIII series and we're going to talk Catherine of Aragon this week. Um, just to get the housekeeping shit out of the way. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. I'm really trying to grow on here. Um, like the video if you like it and leave me a comment. When you subscribe, make sure that you ring the bell on there so that you're notified when I post something. So we're going to get right into it. Hello. So today we're going to talk about Catherine of Aragon and this is episode two of my series about Henry and so I'm going to first go in with my Skin Nova by Vive. I have to prep my skin and I already prepped everything else so here we go. Ready? So Catherine was born on December 16th of 1485 at Episcopal Palace in Castile, Spain. She was the last surviving child of Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella, Isabella I of Castile. In her youth, she was tutored by Alessandro Garaldini. She studied arithmetic. Oh, let me, oh, let me go on with my concealer. She studied arithmetic, canon and civil law classical literature genealogy there we go i was covering all my spots up i think that's pretty much it not bad and heraldry heraldry history philosophy religion and theology oh she i'd say she was a well-rounded girl her upbringing was strong in the Roman, Roman Catholic faith, and she carried this belief through her life. She also learned to speak, read, and write in Castilian Spanish and Latin and spoke French and Greek. She was given lessons in domestic skills like cooking, embroidery, lace making, needlepoint, sewing, spinning, and weaving. On top of all of that, she was taught music, dance, drawing, and court etiquette. Catherine was on the shorter side and had long red hair, blue eyes, a round face with fair skin. Hmm. Catherine was considered a good wife for Henry, Prince of Wales, because of her English ancestry on her mother's side. As, as, Isabel, as Isabel was a descendant of John of Gaunt through her first, through his first two wives of, uh, first was Blanche of Lancaster and the second was Constance of Castile. Catherine's claim, we gotta get going with the makeup stuff, let's go. Catherine's claim to the English throne was actually stronger than Arthur's father. Henry the seventh. Henry was descendant through John's third wife, Catherine Swinford, who at the time of that descendant's birth, he was, or she was, I forget that line, was actually illegitimate, but became legitimate down further, you know, in time. Even though they were made legitimate children, they still were unable to take the throne. This was obviously completely ignored. A marriage between Arthur and Catherine would strengthen the Tudor claim to the throne through Catherine's line. And letters were sent between Henry and Ferdinand II to secure the betrothal of the two children. And so on May 19th of 1499, they were married by proxy. And by proxy means that they had stand-ins for the ceremony and they were actually weren't even present. 
Arthur and Catherine wrote letters to each other in Latin until Arthur was 15, and he was old enough for them to begin their life together. And so Catherine set sail for England on August 17th of 1501 with ambassadors, an archbishop, and a bishop. It sounds like a bad joke, right? Like ambassadors, an archbishop, and a bishop walk into a bar. She also brought a group of African attendants with her, and these were the first Africans recorded to arrive in London and were considered luxury servants. I'm going to point out that this was in the TV show, The Spanish Princess. And I'm glad they held true to this, to the history on this. I thought it was great and it was authentic and so close to the truth. I also liked that she was a redhead in there. And I mean, can you believe me? Anyways, Catherine and Arthur met in Hampshire. Prior to the meeting, Arthur wrote to Catherine's parents and said that he would be a true and loving husband and that he was happy to behold the face of his lovely bride. I think that is so, so cute. Arthur and Catherine spoke to each other in Latin, but they still had a hard time because they learned different Latin pronunciations. They were married at Old St. Paul's on November 14th of 1501. Both of them were 15 years old at the time. And can you imagine, like, I couldn't, my daughter, my oldest, who's now in college, couldn't even bake at 15. I can't even imagine her getting married. Anyways, Catherine and her ladies in waiting were dressed in Spanish style at the wedding. Her dowry was 200,000 ducats and half was paid after they married. What are ducats? It was a trade coin used in Europe until the 1800s. So after their wedding, they went to live at Ludlow Castle in Wales, on the border of Wales. A few months after both Arthur and Catherine became very ill with sweating sickness, possibly because it was making its way around the area. Half her dowry still hadn't been paid, and Henry the Seventh was getting antsy. We're just gonna we're gonna do a little bit of a darker look, I think, today. I'm using this is Swiss chocolate from Mac. Arthur sadly died on April second of two thousand of 1502. Why do I do that? Catherine thankfully recovered from the illness, but she was now left a widow and Henry was getting antsy about the dowry, the half of the dowry still not being paid. So it was agreed that Catherine was going to marry the second son of Henry the seventh, Henry. Now being the heir apparent, and only 11 years old. This obviously couldn't happen right then and there. Catherine's mother passed away. And so her value, Catherine's value, went down. Ferdinand wasn't trusting and held off on paying because he believed the marriage wasn't going to happen. Catherine ended up being held in Durham House in London with little money and she struggled, but she persisted on. Her father made her the Spanish ambassador to England. So she was released and she, back to court she went. Prince Henry, like I said in my first episode, didn't want to marry her and fought it when he legally could at the age of 14. But shortly after his father's death, he said that he would marry Catherine because it was his father's dying wish. Because of Catherine's previous marriage, she, they needed a, oh, we gotta switch my uh, mirror here. Because of her previous marriage, they needed a papal dispensation. And we've talked about what a papal dispensation is before, I believe, in Anne Neville and Isabel's episode. So if you need a refresher, go back and watch that. The papal dispensation was needed because of canon law, and, which forbade a man to marry his brother's widow. 
And Catherine testified that her marriage to Arthur was never consummated. According to canon law, a marriage could be dissolved if it was never consummated. Now, this is a widely widely speculated issue. Uh, They were married for a little over five months, so it's assumed that it was consummated. But they were both ill, so it may not have been. But how could it not have been right after the marriage? Because that was pretty much what they did. Uh, Could have been because of age but um since Catherine was so pious I can't see her lying about it but on the other hand would she have lied to save herself and marry Henry we'll never know personally I don't know I go back and forth on it I guess it depends on when exactly they both became ill. I mean, who wants to shag when they're sick? Ugh. So papal dispensation dispensation was granted and Henry and Catherine were married on June 11th of 1509. Henry had just taken the throne and the wedding was held in a private ceremony in the church outside of Greenwich Palace. She was 23 and he was just about to turn 18. Their coronation was held on June 24th of 1509 at Westminster Abbey and it was a lavish affair. My eye is watering so bad today. I don't know why. I'm just gonna try and salvage this eye here. Did we save it? Did we? Did I? Did I save it? I'm just gonna go back in with that other color and Blend that out. So the coronation was followed by a banquet that was held at Westminster Hall. And the month following the coronation, there were many occasions where she was presented as the new Queen of England to the public, and she made a good impression and was very well received by the English people. Catherine quickly became pregnant with their first child, a daughter who was miscarried on June 30, January 31st of 1510. Catherine had only been six months along at the time so she became pregnant again later in the year and gave birth to a baby boy on january 1st of 1511 little baby henry was finally here and was met with a joust held in his honor as well as many festivities baby prince henry only lived to be seven weeks old and died on february 22nd he died suddenly with no illness and i'm curious if this would be what we now call sids i'd assume so Catherine was pregnant again in 1513 and was hopeful the baby would survive it did not spoiler alert we're gonna get there Catherine was made regent of England with the title governor of the realm and captain general by Henry for when he was away on his French military campaign at the current time Scotland occupied her subject and Catherine was Catherine was busy making standards banners and badges at Richmond Palace I have a hair in my eye. I'm going to go into the corners. I'm almost going to make a that halo, that halo look today. She sent, Catherine sent letters to towns asking them to muster a list of able-bodied men for soldiers. Scotland invaded England on September 13th, I'm sorry, September 3rd of 1513. Catherine ordered Thomas Lovell to raise an army in the Midlands. She issued banners. There we go. Okay. Listen, I'm pulling this together today. She issued banners on September 8th at Richmond Palace and then set north in full armor to speak to the troops and she was pregnant at the time. I will reiterate what I said in my last video. She did not fight in this battle, period. She was actually in Buckingham when she got word that the Battle of Flodden had been won on September 9th. She wrote a letter to Henry and included a bloody coat of King James IV. James had died in the battle and now left Henry's sister a widow. About a week later on September 17th, Catherine gave birth to a baby boy who did not survive. Tensions in the marriage became worse because they were both frustrated and rightfully so. I'm not surprised. But she got pregnant again in in 1514 and that too resulted in another baby boy gone. Following year brought pregnancy number five and come February 18th of 1516 a baby girl is born 
and her name is Mary, and the royal couple were over the moon. Her sixth and final pregnancy was in 1518, and she gave birth to a stillborn girl on on February, I cannot today, okay, cannot, November 10th of 1518. Catherine was 33 at the time. Catherine had grown up in a very devout, grown up very devout in the Roman Catholic religion, and that only increased more as she got older. She continued her interest in academics and continued to grow her knowledge to help her daughter's education. Education became the in thing thanks to Catherine and she donated a large amount of money to several colleges. I'm going to jump off and do my liner real quick. I will be right back. Okay, I'm back. Charles V, if you hear snoring in the background, it is my cat. He is sleeping. It's Jack. So Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor was Catherine's nephew, and he came to England in 1520. Catherine pushed Henry to make an alliance with him over France. After he left, Charles left, she went with Henry to France to celebrate Francis the First on the field of on the field of the cloth of gold. After about two years, Henry declared war on France again and the emperor came back or the emperor was welcomed back into England. There were some plans for him to marry Henry and Catherine's Mary or to wed Mary, the little girl, but it never went through, which honestly would be a little, not a little, it'd be a really lot of fucked up and a little weird. Okay. I am like skimming on my concealer. So in 1522, Catherine got a new lady in waiting fresh off the French court. It was Anne Boleyn. She came to court and began serving as a lady waiting to Catherine. Well, we all know this didn't end well for Catherine, like at all. Come 1525, Henry was obsessed with Anne. She was somewhere between 10 and 17 years younger than Henry and her exact Anne's exact birth year isn't known. At this time Catherine was about 40 and unable to have another baby. Henry thought the marriage was cursed and he wanted out. I'm gonna try that like triangle tour. There we go. I know, I look nuts when I'm doing this. It doesn't look crazy. Henry believed the marriage was wrong in the eyes of God because her uh, because of her marriage to his brother, even though she claimed until her dying day that they had never consummated the marriage. His desire for a son became his driving factor in his net up. An annulment was thrown around, but Catherine was def- defiant as it was brought, when it was brought to her. The King's Secretary, William Knight. I don't know which one I like, contra I like better. The way I usually do it or this. Anyways, William Knight was sent to the Pope in Rome to sue for the annulment on the claims that Pope Julius, who gave the papal dispensation, was under false pretenses. At the time Knight was in Rome, the Pope was a prisoner of Catherine's nephew, Charles V, and couldn't, William Knight couldn't get access to him. So he returned turn and now Henry put the matter into the hands of Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. Wolsey put together a court with and he and Compeggio presided. Henry and Catherine were both called to be present for it and to present their like both spouses had to testify and no decision was made. The ambassador Eustace Chapuis served as her legal candidate. Chapuis was had a legal background and was close with her nephew Charles V. The matter had to be brought to Rome. No decision was made. They had to send it to Rome. Again, look at last week um, as to why I think that that happened, why they didn't make a decision. Wolsey was dismissed from court and started a secret plan to have Anne Boleyn forced to exile. He was in talks with the Pope about it. So when this was decided, discovered. He was arrested for treason, but he died from illness before he could ever stand trial. Catherine was banished from court in four, um, in 1530. Her rooms had been given to Anne Boleyn. 
the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, had died, and now Thomas Cranmore was given the position. This didn't bode well for Catherine. Henry decided to have his, or decided to annul his marriage to Catherine, and John Fisher became a trusted advisor, her as well as one of her chief supporters. He went to legate court, legate court for her on her behalf, and he said that like John the Baptist, he was ready to die on behalf of the indissol- indissol- indissolubility of the marriage. This pissed Henry off, and he wrote a long Latin address to the legates in an answer to John's speech. John's copy of this still exists, as well as his manuscript that showed how little he feared Henry's anger. The removal of the cause to Rome ended Fisher's role, but Henry never gave forgave him for it. Others that supported Catherine were Thomas More, Henry's sister, Mary Tudor, Charles V, Pope Paul III, and Martin Luther, which was I was I found a little odd I guess because they kind of based the whole reformation off of Martin Luther and like his talkings so I found that weird anyway so now things start to heat up and Henry had gone to meet with Francis the first of France and had brought Anne with him once they returned to England they secretly married this has been said to be January 24th or 25th of 1533. Since Henry was still legally married to Catherine, he defended it by saying Catherine had already been married. Okay. And can we talk about like sister wives right now? Weird. So she was a widow when you married her buddy. And if their marriage had been consummated, then he was legally in, within his right due to canon. He he said if it had been con, a consummated that he was within his right based on canon law to dissolve the marriage. Delusion. I loved Catherine. Catherine. I thought they, I think they would have, I don't know. I feel bad for her. I really do. Okay. So after Catherine's banishment, she moved quite a few times. First, she lived at Moore Castle in Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire. If I, if you're from there and I'm messing this up, please let me know how to pronounce it correctly. I'm trying. So she moved there in late 1531 and then moved to the Royal Palace of at Hatfield from May to September of 1532. Elsing Palace for the next six months. Amphill Castle from February to July of 1533. And then Bucket Towers in Cape in Cambridgeshire from July 33rd from July of 33 um, uh, to May of 34. I feel like, <laughs> Kat, um, what's her name? Oh, what the frick is her name? Amber Heard's lawyer right now. I'm trying. I'm trying. Anyways. So she finally moved to Kimbleton Castle in Cambridgeshire. She spent her time in one room and only left to attend mass. She wore her hair. She wore a hair shirt, which is an undergarment that was usually made of animal hair or coarse cloth and was used as a self-imposed repentance and mortification of the skin. That is so sad. Like, so sad. She was allowed occasional visitors, but was forbidden to see her daughter, as well as forbidden to write letters to, they were forbidden to write letters to each other. Henry, uh, however, letters did secretly get through to each, they had people passing letters between the two of them, which I'm sorry, that's, you don't do that. No, Henry, no. So Henry offered for them to see each other only if they would acknowledge that Anne was the new queen, but both mother and daughter refused to do this. On May 13th of 1533, what was I doing? Oh, I need my highlight. Where is it? On May, th- on May 13th of 1533, Cranmer, who was sitting in judgment of a special court at Dunstable Priory, declared the marriage unlawful, even though Catherine had testified her marriage to Arthur had never been consummated. Cranmer ruled that Henry and Anne's marriage was valid on May 28th of 1533, just a few months after they secretly got married. Until the end of her life, Catherine would refer to herself as Henry's only lawful wife and England's rightful queen. Henry refused her right to any title except Dowager Princess of Wales. Oh, I did it. Okay, I thought I missed my brow up. Using her first marriage title. So he was a fucking brat. Until the end of her life, Catherine would refer to... Christ, 
Tiffany, come on. In late December of 1535, Catherine knew her end was near. She made her will and wrote to her nephew, Charles V, and asked him to protect her daughter. I think she knew. She knew. Catherine died at Kimbolton Castle on January the 7th of 1536, possibly of cancer. King Henry, King Henry received the news the following day. I don't want to discuss, I don't want to discuss Henry's reaction to her dying because I find it very disrespectful to talk about it in this episode. Um, so I'll talk about it in the next Henry the Henry the eighth one, which will be next week. Um, however, I will say that yellow is the Spanish color of mourning. So it's possible that's the reason why he dressed in yellow. However, it's said later in the day that Henry and Anne cried privately, individually for her for her death. It was if it was discovered during her embalming that Catherine's heart was black and it was thought at the time that had that she had been poisoned, but modern medical expert experts say it's probably due to cancer. I didn't even know cancer could turn your heart black. Awful. I'm going to jump off and do my um, this stuff. Mascara. I'll be right back. back. So I did mascara. I did a little bit of my Charlotte Tilbury liner. Because I just felt I needed a little bit of liner in there. And then I did use... Um, <clears throat> the V Velvet Sands Lip Liner and Matte Lipstick in Flesh Pop, which I don't even think they make anymore, but it's a good one. Okay, I'm back. So Catherine's funeral took place at Peterborough Cathedral on January 29th. She requested to be buried at a monastery that belonged to Franciscan Observant Friars, but it was denied because Friars convents no longer existed. Her funeral was that of a dowager princess and not a queen. Henry forbade their daughter, or had forbidden their daughter, Mary, to attend, and he didn't attend either. It was a very somber funeral. She was brought to Peterborough Cathedral on a wagon drawn by six horses. Her body was covered in gold frieze and a red velvet cross, and the wagon itself was covered in black velvet. Her niece, through her sister-in-law, Mary Tudor, Eleanor Brandon, acted as chief mourner. After she was buried in a grave at the lowest step of the high altar. She remains in Peterborough Cathedral and over her tomb is a golden title of Catherine, Queen of England. Her daughter lived on to become Mary I of England and during her reign it was declared that her parents' marriage was good and valid. Queen Mary also had several portraits commissioned of her mother and I tend to think Catherine would have been very or it was very proud of Mary. I mean, she became a queen in her own right. So fun facts for this week are her mother reformed Spain alongside her father Ferdinand. They supported and financed Christopher Columbus's 1492 voyage to the New World. Her motto, motto was humble and loyal. The book of education, the book The Education of Christian Women by Juan Luis or Luis Vives was dedicated to and commissioned by her in 1524. Her birth name was Catalina de Aragon and her daughter Mary was the first queen regent of England. So that's all I have for Catherine today. Um, all the products that I use today are going to be listed down below. This was episode two of the Henry Tudor series, Henry VIII series. Next week we're going to cover, uh, it will be part two of Henry. So that'll probably take us through Jane Seymour, I think. We'll see where we get. Um, if you liked this video, please subscribe and give it a like for me. And when you subscribe, if you could ring the bell, that would be great because then you're going to get notifications on when I um, upload or if I go live. And I think that's about it. If you have any questions or like comments, concerns, please comment below. I do read them and I do reply. I do like them. Um, remember to follow me on Instagram and TikTok. On Instagram and on TikTok, I always do um, on this day. So whatever happens on that day, I post if there's anything interesting. Um, that's about it for this week. I will see you in the next one. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Bye.